Hello and welcome to the, the webcast here. This is Mike Walsh speaking and Tim Randy is joining me. We're going to be talking about some of the top mistakes that we see in, in the SQL Server field. Um, so by, by way of quick introductions, just want to in introduce ourselves. Tim, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Tim Randy. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I run the Columbus, Georgia SQL Users Group and I'm a regional mentor for PASS. I'm a partner with Lynchpin People. All my contact information is here, and you can see uh, some of the specialties or areas that I like to kind of focus in on. Um, but that's that's enough about me. Perfect. I'll talk about myself for a couple seconds. I, some people say I like doing that, so I'll just continue that that trend. Um, I'm also an MVP. I'm also a partner at Lynchpin People. I also run a SQL Server user group. This one's up in, in New Hampshire. Um, it's called the Seacoast SQL Server Users Group. We're about an hour north of Boston. And um, my specialties and focus areas are, are pretty close to Tim's. Um, actually, we're both chicken farmers, although Tim, Tim adds, uh, if you go back a slide, you'll see Tim, Tim also does tilapia farming. Um, so he, he's, he's got one up on me there. But that, that's enough about us. You know, we're not here to talk about the presenters. We're here to talk about some of the issues that we see in the field. And before I go to the next slide, I'm going to ask the question, the rhetorical question, when nobody's here talking to us. But the, the question is, what do you think? What do you think the most important thing we we find in the field? What do you think the most important lack or, or miss we see in the field is? And I'll give you a couple seconds to kind of think in your heads what it's going to be. And, and if if you said missing backups or lack of recent backups, you're you're pretty accurate. Um, I'm going to ask Tim to speak about this. Tim, Tim, you wrote a book about backup recovery, and this is kind of one of your pet peeves and passions in life. So, you know, talk about some of the findings that, that, that we find, that you find, consultant, and, and what, what can be done about it. Oh, thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, I've uh, written a book. Uh, we'll have it listed on um, a, a slide toward the end. It's out on Amazon. Uh, typically, what I, what I find is either missing backups, uh, no backups, or improper backup routines where it really re really will not meet the SLA. Uh, people may think that they can do point in time recovery, however the database is in simple recovery mode and they're only doing nightly uh, you know, full backups. So one of the things that I really like to do is uh, you run a script to go and pull the last full, the last differential, and the last two transaction log backups as well as capture the recovery model of each database in the system. And then I go through and I, I look through and look for situations where I may have a, a, a database in full recovery, uh, I have a full backup, but I've never uh, seen the log backup. Uh, in that case, the transaction log would just be continuing to grow. Um, we see this way too often out on the forums where somebody will say, you know, hey, I need help, my server has crashed. Um, my database is 10 gig in size, but my transaction log is 400 gigabytes in size. You know, what do I do? Um, so I really like to look and see what strategy is put in place. Uh, talk with the, the line of business or the, um, uh, the technician I'm working with and, and ask, you know, will this meet your requirements and point out any kind of um, issues that I see with the routine. I also like to look and, or, or talk to the client and ask, uh, are they validating the backups? Uh, way too many times I've found that um, you know, the, the, they may be taking a backup that somebody might have gone in and, and marked it to backup to disk null. Well, that's a, a backup, but you have no file that you can restore. Um, I, I like to, to talk with them about um, you know, are they you know, restoring the databases, you know, having a, a, a true restore validation process. Um, I always provide the, the script that I use. Uh, you can see the URL here. It's just timrandy.com forward slash backups. Uh, there's a little blog entry and, and a copy of the script uh, that I go and run. And um, you know, many times in, in talking with the clients, we find out that you know, they may be doing excessive backups on a database that doesn't change, you know, where they're doing full and, and transaction log backups, but it's really an archive database. Uh, that's updated once a month, so we can turn off the, the transaction log. We can set that to a simple recovery model. Um, but that, that's, that's really it, is, is making sure that um, you have no assumptions just because the, the process been, has been running for years. You always want to validate and, and check it out. Um, but if you don't have backups, you know, our primary job is being able to recover data. Um, so that's, that's number one in my book. Yeah, mine too. Absolutely. Um, 
I think a pretty you know so it, this is really this is really critical and, and I really like how you know with the slides here and you talk about law in the book is you 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 really you know this area here backups are really big and I'd say a lot of clients we come in and do a you know our well DBA exam process on we we find backups not being done but even more frequent we'll find backups done but we just don't find that recovery and and um, it's uh, it's always a bad day when somebody says, "Hey, my backups never errored, so I must be good." Um, and uh, that's really that's so important. Um, and I agree. You know, if, if people if people don't if people don't take anything else away from this presentation except, except for one thing, um, I, I really want it to be this slide. You know, the backups. The, there's there's no reason um, with the tools, the scripts, the books. You know, t Tim, your your book is a. We'll talk about that later in the, in the presentation too. In the resource slide, it's a very affordable book, and, and it's um, it's been updated. It's actually got a lot of details and data in there. There's free scripts everywhere. In 2014, there's really no reason why um, why we should come into an environment and find find bad backup practices. So that's that, that's key. Um, well, absolutely, and and you know, the first time you have to restore your database shouldn't be in production. And, um, that's right. You know, having people you know share that where oh my gosh I was sweating bullets I was nervous I lost you know 20 pounds you know while that database was restored and I was so scared I'm like you should have been <laughs> the last time you restored it should have been last week you should know that um, uh, you know how it's done but you know, Mike one of the things that I've you know I find you know just as important as backups is is checking for corruption um, because. You know, one of the things I discuss in the book is how forgiving SQL Server is in backing up data. That you know, if you have corruption, well, you know, most cases it it back up the corruption as well. So, you know, what what have you seen out there doing these well DBA exams, uh, dealing with corruption? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think I think. I mean, you correct me if you're wrong, Tim, from your experience consulting, but I, I think it's pretty fair to say that more often than not, I'll I'll find people doing backups. Uh, maybe they're not doing the best practices, you know, and they're not doing their log backups. We find that a lot. Um, but I typically find customers say, yeah, I know backups are important, and I know I should be doing them. But what I find a lot, though, is customers not ever doing a DBCC check DB. Um, is, is that your experience, too, too? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I find that you know, way, way too often. Uh, the excuse that I hear is, well, we used to do them, but they were so resource intensive that we, we turned them off. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, 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 a really, it's a really bad mistake to get into um, because here, here's the deal. Um, when, when you run a, a check DB, a DBCC check DB process, it, it's looking for, for database corruption. It, it's looking for different types of corruption um, in, in, in your database. And your users will find corruption for you as well. So you, you, you don't need to do a check DB ever. You will someday find your corruption. But here's what happens if you don't do your check DB. So don't, don't, don't leave the webcast after what I just said, because then, then you'll, you'll come and you'll blame me for, for the mistakes you'll bump into. You don't need to do a check DB if you want to find corruption someday. Because what happens is someday your user touches a page of data. Um, an eight kilobyte page of data in SQL Server. When they touch that page of data, if there's corruption on it, they'll get an error message in SQL Server saying can't read the data. It'll be one of one of several error messages um, saying basically your data is corrupt. You you have no data to read, or or the data is not not the way it's supposed to be. Can't help you, and it's a pretty bad error. Whatever they were doing kind of dies. Their connection may be reset likely to, and and now they're in trouble. Um, that, that happens every time a page is, with corruption is accessed. The problem, though, is not every page of data gets accessed all the time. So imagine you have a big, big database that has a lot of documents in it or a lot of data of some sort. Well, you might not touch all that, all that data or all those documents every day. You might not have you know, as many users needing as much data as you have every day. So what could happen is you could have data become corrupt. And corruption is not is not caused by SQL. It's it's normally an operating system or or file system error. Um, so data gets written to disk, and something happens to that data after it was written to disk, where it doesn't write the way SQL Server expected it to be written, and and, and sort of the, the contract between SQL and storage was broken. Some something underneath SQL Server um, broke that contract, and and the the data is not on disk anymore like SQL expected. And what happens is 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 um, that corruption just sits there. But you may never touch some of that, those pages of data that have corruption because you just may not 
not in, interact with them. Um, and then all of a sudden, eventually, because you're doing some sort of history report or a customer who never comes to the store comes to the store or whatever your situation is, and you touch that corrupt data, and you say, oh no, my data is corrupt. Even if you had a really good backup strategy, um, and I argue you can't have a good backup strategy if you don't have a good CheckDB strategy, um, but even if you had a great backup strategy doing all the proper things, retaining a lot of backups, what you could have, have happen though is you could find corruption that happened sometime, some number of weeks, days, or months ago. You don't know exactly when. And you can go back to your, to your latest backups or the backups you have, and you can find corruption on all those backups. Well, now you're really in trouble because now your options are pretty limited. If you're lucky, you might be able to rebuild an index or you might be able to figure out what pages of data were affected and, and maybe say, you know what, it's not important data, we can get rid of it. Or you may say, oh no, I'm in trouble. Um, doing a DBCC check DB, uh, to, to make it really short what it does, reads all the it reads every page. It tells SQL Server, I want to look at my entire database. Even if I'm not a user trying to access my entire database, I want to look at my entire database, look at all my pages, and I want to see if there's any signs of corruption. So you should be doing that as frequently as you can. And the schedule really depends. Um, if you have a nine to five environment and you have a healthy overnight window where there's nothing going on in your server and, and you can finish a CheckDB in, in the window, go ahead and do it every night. If, if you can only do it weekly, that's fine. Um, you know, you might even do check tables and there's things you do with large databases. There's a lot of, a lot of best practices. We have some links and the resources and, we can kind of in a chat, we can discuss some of these as well. But the point is get get running them. And and you want to make sure that you run them so you so you can see your corruption before you get rid of all of your backups. So if you keep a week of backup retention and, and you keep say a week of transaction log backups and you recover to a point in time, well then if you run check DBs every week, you should be okay because at worst you can go back that whole week. Um, if you only keep two days of log backups though and you, you wait a week, you could theoretically have three or four days where you can't recover to. You don't know exactly which day the corruption started. So the um, the really important thing is you need to have a scheduled task or job to run it. Um, and you know, I'd say that one of the things that we've encountered a lot of this year just I, I, there's no no rhyme or reason. Um, these things just come in waves. But we've had a lot of clients calling us up this year, especially saying, "Hey, I have corruption. I don't know what it means." I don't know how I got here. I don't know when it started. Can you help us? Um, and those have been some pretty tough conversations. You know, we say we've saved some people. We've got some data back. We've done some creative restores. But sometimes you've had to say, listen, you have lost data here, and you've never been running CheckDB, and your backup strategy was bad. You know, you're you're kind of in trouble here. Um, those aren't fun conversations, are they, Tim? They are not. Um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that you know this really has been our year of of dealing with corruption. Um, and you know, six years prior to this, I, I've encountered it a, a handful of times and was blessed that it was mostly in, in development environments or was, was related to us uh, doing some type of you know, upgrade from you know, SQL 2000 to, to 2008 where somebody had manually gone in and, and flipped some stuff um, where you know, we were able to go back to the 2000 version, fix some things, and then you know, successfully upgrade. Um, but something you, you, you kept talking about was uh, you know, about logs, you know, uh, and I know you were talking about keeping transaction log backups, but if you'll advance to the next slide, um, it's where we're talking about you know, other type of log cleanup. Um, and you know, this comes into your, your backup your history, uh, your SQL Server error log. Um, in doing some of these well DBA exams, this is something that you know I, I typically always come across. Um, well, I can't say always. Eighty percent of the time, I'll find that you know, backup history isn't being you know cleared out, and you know clients aren't recycling their their error log. So when I have to go in and and look in the you know the error log, the thing goes back you know, multiple years and has you know, hundreds of thousands of of entries in it. And it really makes it unruly to be able to, um, you know, go through and troubleshoot. And in the backup history, um, I, I, I kind of laugh when I, uh, you know, share this is when I in, inherited a, a, a database environment many years ago. It was a SQL Server 2000, uh, you know, consolidation server, had about 150 databases on it. 
was log shipping every 15 minutes to um, a, a server in the, the DR site. And this server had been up and running for many, many years, uh, mm. four, four plus years. And you know, going through and, and looking at the, the system databases and, and uh, you know, prepping for you know, some upgrades, I noticed, wow, you know, MSDB is 18 gigabytes. <laughs> um, yep. All the other ones I had seen were, were in the hundreds of megabytes and yeah. uh, started kind of nosing around. I, I have a little handy script that you know, will we'll go out and grab all the, uh, the table sizes and you know, ran it and noticed it was the backup history and backup media set and, and all those things and, and realized, oh, wow, yeah, um, I really have no need for backup history four and five years ago. Matter of fact, I have no need for backup history uh, for any files that I, I don't have that I could restore. Now, sure. there may be... And you don't really need it. Sorry, you, you don't need it for anything, really, technically speaking, right? It's just if you want to do a restore to the GUI. Um, right. Well, and if you want it to self-populate, you know, go in and um, you know, yeah, do the GUI. And, and, right. Um, absolutely. You, you don't need that history. Uh, you wouldn't have that history on a new server. Uh, but it, oddly enough, in, in this environment, if you went and right-clicked through the GUI to try to restore a database, you could literally go to lunch for about a week and dinner, and um, I mean, it, it would lock up in, back in the day Enterprise Manager. Um, so I, I learned quickly then, early in my, my DBA career, that uh, th this is something that Microsoft provides you the, the stored procedure to, to you know, clear the history, you know, SP underscore delete underscore backup history. And don't be fooled, the, the backup history is also restore history. It, it clears them both. Um, it provides it, but it doesn't run automatically. That's one of those little knobs uh, that, that you have to turn and, and know about yourself. So you just execute the, the stored procedure and, and pass it uh, the date of all history prior to that date that you want it to, to, to delete, and, it, and it's gone. Uh, some yep. third-party tools take care of this for you. Um, thank you to, to those uh, partners that, that include that. But if you've you know, rolled your own or using database maintenance plans and things like that, um, you may find that you, you should be purging that history. And with the error log, um, th that thing only uh, recycles every time SQL Server service is restarted. So hopefully that is not a, a daily occurrence for you. Um, but you, you yeah, probably want to be recycling that log a little bit more frequently than, than Patch Tuesdays. And uh, the default value is set to six, so you only have seven logs. You have six previous and, and the active log, and you can dial that up to 99, so you can keep you know, much more history there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so you know, speak, speaking of kind of a, the best practices and and maintenance, and you know, kind of continuing this trend. You know, not all of our findings have to do with maintenance, but quite a lot of them do. There, there's two more categories of maintenance I want to talk about. Um, so let my slideshow catch up to me here. I want to, sorry, there we go. Talk about statistics and index maintenance. You know, we'll talk about statistics first. Um, this, is, this is something that we, we see a lot. Um, I, I, I hear conversations, Tim, you, tell me if you ever heard anybody say this to you. Um, oh, I don't need to do this because I keep auto-update stats on. You've never heard that, right? <laughs> I wish I hadn't. Yeah, we hear a lot. So SQL Server keeps statistics. These statistics, um, these basically tell SQL Server information about your, your tables and your columns and your indexes and how your data is distributed. And, and they, they inform the query optimizer what the best plan to, to make is for a particular query. So what type of join to do behind the scenes and you know, what type of index operation to do. And by default, um, statistics are, are allowed to, they're, they're enabled for auto, auto update, which means if a certain amount of statistics change, um, you, you get an, an auto update of those stats, which is great. Sometimes you can have a large table, in, in the, or even a small table, or a medium-sized table, and, and you don't get the amount of data change that's, that's necessary to trigger that auto-update stats. But having updated statistics would actually still be beneficial. So on a regular basis, you should be running an update statistics job. And, and you know, we have some resources in the resource slide as well about, about this in our, in our presentation, but it's really simple. There's a great script out there um, from Ola Hallengren. There's other scripts out there as well, and there's tools that do this for you too. But we we have a couple links to his to his scripts as well. Um, but his scripts will will kind of do some intelligent um, updating of statistics, and we'll talk in a minute about indexes too. But these these basically 
by doing this manually on a weekly or, or daily, again, depends on your, your, your window for, for um, maintenance work, updating these will, will help your optimizer make the, the, um, the best decision. Um, and, and a lot of times, a client will call me up and they'll say, you know, this query has been kind of getting slower and getting worse and I'm not really sure what's happened. We've started having some problems. Um, and and I'll, you know, I'll come in as a consultant and um, my goal is not to bill as many hours as I can. It's to get the problem fixed. And a lot of times I'll, I'll look kind of for the obvious signs. So I'll, sometimes I'll see their query plan and I'll see their actual rows are different from their estimated rows. And that doesn't necessarily mean your stats are out of date, but it's it's a it could be it's a symptom of that. And I'll I'll kind of look and say, oh wow, your your stats were last updated in 2011. What happened in April of 2011? And they'll say, oh, that's when we that's when we did our first data load. Um, and you know, it's, this conversation is happening in 2014. And I'll say, all right, well, your stats haven't updated since then. Why don't we just try and do an update stats job before you spend a whole bunch of money on me? And let's see if we can fix it. And um, and and doesn't always fix the problem right away, but when it does fix the problem right away, I, I, I wish I could be there to see their faces as they're as they're excited about the change. You, you probably had that experience too, Tim, right? Yeah, more times than I would like to count. Um, yep. You know where you know, a simple statistics you know, you know update has fixed so so much um, from you know, ETL processes. You know, seeing a client go from you know, half a day to a couple of hours. Um, and, and it's always one of those things that you hear. You know, well, things have been running fine, and just over time, it's just gotten slower and slower and slower. It's like, yep. yeah, um, I, I, I completely know what you're talking about. Yeah. It, it had, in the same vein as, as statistics updating, our index maintenance. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of index fragmentation? You know, talk, talk about this picture here, <laughs> and <laughs> talk about and talk about what uh, talk about what it means, and talk about what to do about it. This, yeah, this yeah, I always like to ask uh, my my uh, audience uh, you know, prior to advancing to the slide and, and ask, hey, what causes fragmentation? And uh, if they've ever you know, heard some of our, our colleagues, they'll say fragmentation, and it also kills a kitten you know, or a, a shrinking, and it kills kittens. Um, that's right. That's but, right. But I always like to say, well, you know, no, nothing much causes fragmentation other than inserts, updates, and deletes, you know, which is pretty much all that <laughs> uh, you know occurs yeah. with our, our everything, data. Everything but select. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, it, it's been a while. I, I would love to see Microsoft go back and, and update this white paper. Um, you know, run through the same battery of tests, but I can only assume it took them weeks or months to to go through and, and do that amount of QA. But you know that that infamous white paper. Uh, they were able to determine that fragmentation can degrade performance anywhere from 13 to 460 uh, percent. You know, depending on the size of the environment and the, the fragmentation level. And you know, I've, I've encountered this uh, many times, either at you know, my, my old W2 employer to to various you know, consultants where you know I step in. You know, this new environment got dropped in my lap where. You know, some other department went and built it, and we never knew about it until they had a problem, um, and, and you know, called us up, and you know, I'm taking a look at it, and you know, nearly every index is 90% fragmented, and statistics haven't been updated, and you know, just you know, all this stuff that we're talking about in, in this presentation and, and in our white paper, and you know, I'll go through and update statistics, and then schedule you know, index maintenance, and uh, you know, go through and, and reorg or, or rebuild the indexes, and you know, by the time all that gets done, they think they, they swear that I upgraded and put them on the fastest supercomputer you know known to man. I'm like, no, um, I just ordered your data so that you know SQL Server doesn't have to work as hard you know to find it. Um, yeah. You're dealing with fragmentation is super super simple. I mean, it, you either rebuild, you reorganize, or you drop and recreate the index and. You know, for smaller environments, database maintenance plans. You know, I, I don't like database maintenance plans, but for you know, small, mid-sized shops, I mean, they work. Uh, I don't particularly like them because it's either rebuild or reorganize. Um, I like the Ola Halligren or you know, er, other third-party tools where it uses some intelligence based on the level of fragmentation in the index. Uh, it will either reorganize or rebuild. And what I've ended up doing is. Uh, I schedule it to run daily, and you know, typically it's small reorgs 
because the data never has a chance to get so fragmented that it would cause a rebuild. And if you have Enterprise Edition, I mean, the rebuild does, you can specify you know, with online, so it's, uh, it doesn't cause you know, uh, production issues. Um, also, with, you know, in the index maintenance, I look for duplicate indexes because the bulk of my career has been um, with a, you know, a, a single client and they use a whole lot of third-party applications. We call it COTS, commercially, you know, commercial, commercial off-the-shelf software. Uh, so we deal with hundreds of applications from third parties and you know, guess what? Their development shops are just like everybody else's where they have uh, different uh, you know, turnover, different developers coming in, the next version, you know, the new developer can do it better and smarter and decides that he's going to create all new indexes the way he didn't drop any of the old. So now we have a lot of indexes that are exactly the same, just a slightly different name. And you know, I, I joke and say, well, indexes make things run faster, so you know, the more of them you have, the better, you know, right? And like, no, because now every insert, update, delete, uh, it is double the overhead for none of the game. So checking out for duplicate indexes, it, you know, they waste space, they waste I.O. Um, I, I never advocate to just go and, and run a script and find them and drop them. You, know, you want to investigate, make sure uh, included columns, that there's no skew there. Always script them out before you drop them in case there's an issue. You can easily recreate them. Uh, but yeah, fragmentation, uh, you know, th this little uh, uh, diagram here, it, it kind of kind of explains it you know, visually. You know, you have a filing cabinet where, or your, your bedroom, your sock drawer, whatever you want, where things are just kind of scattered. You know, if you organize it, it it's easier to find. Agree. I agree, Tim. Um, and, and that's, you know, it, it's big, right? Because it's this, you know, there are schools of thought that say, oh, don't worry about it so much because, you know, memory is less expensive and, and you can do compression and you can use new, new I.O. But, but I, I, I still see this quite often where, where fixing, fixing fragmented indexes um, makes, makes a difference. It definitely does. Um, well, you know, it, it does. And you mentioned memory. I mean, it, it's very common now to find you know, more and more systems with higher levels of memory. Um, where it used to be 16 and 32, 64 gig of RAM was, was the, the most, and now, yeah, you know, I, I come across servers that have you know half, half a terabyte, terabyte, uh, even two terabytes recently, and yeah, that's a lot of memory. But guess what? That two terabyte system had 20 terabytes of data behind it, so still all the data can't fit in memory. So, you know, the the fragmentation you know, is still uh, a, a big 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 uh, part of. Uh, tuning a system. But Mike, yeah. you, know, you, you do a, a lot of these exams, you've, you've connected into you know, clients all over the world. Um, you know, me, I, I've, I've done a good bit, but you know, I, I would like to see and, and hear from you on uh, what's been your, your experience with memory settings. Yeah, yep. Um, and, and I'll tell you, you know, there's, there's a couple schools of thought on some of this, but, but I think what it boils down to is what works for, for you. But there, there's some basics, though. So, so well, well, you can go out there and find kind of discussions about all sorts of topics of memory with lock pages of memory and impact of sending them in to a certain level and, and all this. But the, the, basic, the basic principle here is we often, I can't tell you how many times I, I see the maximum memory set, um, you know, set, to, set to this, set to two petabytes. Um, which I've yet to find the server with two petabytes of memory. That would be a fun server to play with. Um, I think the biggest server I have right now is a server that has four terabytes of memory. Um, and that, that's a fun server. Um, but SQL Server, as every, I think everybody in this webcast knows, um, I think everybody in IT knows that SQL Server is aggressive with its memory. It, it likes memory. And if you think about what SQL Server does, you, that's good. That, that actually functions as designed. So, SQL Server wants to take all of your data and, and, and put as much of it as it possibly can into the buffer cache or the data cache, whatever you want to call it, but it's the buffer pool. It's where the data sits um, when it's off of disk and memory. It's still in disk, but it's in memory as well. And every time you run a query, every time you do anything that has to do with memory, SQL Server has to have that memory 
in, I'm sorry, every time you, you deal with data. So if you write a select query, you know, select a bunch of columns from a table, um, and you return that, that data, that data has to come from memory. And that, that data is either in two states for, for the purpose of this discussion. It's either already in memory or it's not in memory yet. If it's not in memory yet, it has to come into memory. And SQL Server, once it pulls it into memory, is going to keep it in memory as long as it can. And, and, and with kind of a least recently used, and, and, and it's, more, it's more than that. But with a couple of algorithms, SQL Server determines when that memory should go back, you know, free up and let something else come into it. Well, if, if you don't have enough memory, SQL Server has to dump stuff out of memory and, and pull, to pull other stuff into memory because nothing can be talked to directly from disk. Your data has to be in the buffer pool. So SQL Server likes to have high memory. And, and, and if you put a lot of memory in most SQL servers, SQL Server is going to use it. Um, now there's limits and there's every situation is different, but SQL Server is going to take what, what you allow it. The default out of the, the box max value, and then the max memory value is, is what, what tells the buffer pool how much it can, can have is set to two petabytes. It's basically, for all, for all intents and purposes, it's unlimited. Um, and, and what that means now is SQL Server can say, oh, I have a server, I'm on a server with you know, 128 gigabytes of memory. Um, I have a database that's you know, maybe a few hundred gigs, and I'm running some big queries on it. I've talked to a lot of the data. SQL Server is going to probably use really close to that 128 gigs of memory. It's not going to be so aggressive that it kills the operating system, but it, but it's going to be aggressive enough that it can actually cause some performance issues for SQL and for Windows, and that kind of crescendos and causes an effect for anything else. So a really good rule of thumb is set a maximum memory. In fact, this is this is advice that uh, I'm trying to think right here, Tim, and I don't think I can find an example where I would tell somebody don't set max memory. Can can you think of an example where you would say that? Um. Not with 2008 R2 and below. Um, it, with, with 2012, you know, the, the memory manager was completely redesigned, and I've been in a couple of different talks where uh, Microsoft has gone and done um, done various tests and have found that you know with the, the memory manager, um, you know, it it really has some kind of fail safes in there to protect against starving the the operating system. But even sure. then, everyone that I've talked to that is deploying 2012 and 2014 with this memory manager uh, redesign, uh, they're saying, yeah, no, I still set max memory. Um, yeah, I did just the same. The, the, yep. the comfort level's there. Now, now what I have heard and, and seen it as a trend is you know, with the 2008 R2 and, and below, uh, because the, the max memory really belonged to, uh, was for the buffer pool, um, that we have 10 we still would have uh, tend to leave a little bit of extra memory there for the operating system and for still for SQL Server as well for the components not governed under the max setting. In 2012, max means max. Um, so we found that with our old you know, algorithms or, or formulas that we were still leaving way too much memory for the uh, for the operating system. So we've started dialing that up uh, by monitoring the uh, M bytes available uh, uh, performance counter. Uh, but outside of that, no, I mean, Still setting you know, max memory as a as a safeguard. Uh, I would be willing to 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 venture out and say that uh, within the next 12 to 18 months, we might start having more faith um, in saying with you know, you know, SQL Next and and 12 and 14, maybe it it can handle it you know, well enough that we don't have to set max. But uh, I'm not there yet. Yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> um, I'm not either. Um, and you know the the important thing here, I think, is we find people not setting the max, um, and we suggest you do set a max. We you know there's formulas out there. Um, we we have a couple links to our resources, but but we, we want to leave the operating and, and it depends on the amount of memory you have. But we you know I think a general rule of thumb, um, and Jonathan Cahayas actually has a pretty complex formula out there that I, that I like and recommend. But a general rule of thumb and his his kind of his calculations work out to to be in the range, but somewhere between 10 and 20 percent is what I want to see that left behind. And, and actually, the more memory you have, uh, you know, the, the, the more important, um, especially in 2008 or 2 and below, but, but really even in 2012 and 2014, in my experience, the more important it becomes to set a maximum. Um, and, and, you know, because if you have a large server, a lot of memory, does it, you know, the, you're probably having a larger database. Um, you're probably having bigger servers. You're probably having more queries. You know, you, you spent the money on the, the big box. Um, 
setting the maximum becomes important. Um, and you know, and, and, you, and there's no right, there's no one size fits all right answer. Um, the calculations really help you, and, and then and then experience helps. And every experience is different. You know, I, I think the key is acknowledge you need to have a maximum, um, set it, and kind of watch. If if you see that man, I, I could probably bump that up a little bit because the free and available is really staying free and available. It's it's, it's either in use by the system cache, which is considered free because it's it's still available, um, or it's truly free not even used by the system cache, well, you might bump that max up and see if SQL takes advantage of it. Um, you can kind of find that right number. I also, I also recommend people set minimum memory. Um, it, you know, if you don't set minimum memory, is it the end of the world? No. But by setting minimum, SQL Server doesn't grab that memory right away. What it does is it, is it, it carves out, hey, I need this much memory. I would like to have it, please. When I hit this level, I don't want to go below it. Now, there are circumstances where SQL Server will still allow itself to go below it. Um, under pressure, so SQL doesn't sit there, um, sort of being angry and aggressive, but but it, it will it will try not to give it up. Um, so we we like to see it a minimum. I, I think, you know, again, it depends, but for a single instance environment on, on one server, 25 to 33 percent is probably where where I end up. Tim, is that kind of in the range you end up? Yeah, I pretty well shoot the 30 percent. Yep, and, and then that tends to work. Um, you know, the, the key here, I think there's two keys that when we find. Uh, we find a lot of clients that don't have enough memory. Um, and memory, memory is really not the expensive, evil resource that it, that it was, well, back in SQL Server 2000 when that was new. Memory is a very plentiful resource. And, and uh, sometimes I'll have a client and we'll have a conversation. And they're sitting on 64 gigs of memory. And they're in enterprise. Um, and they want to go to 128. Or they're in 2014. And they can go to 128 in standard edition. And they say, hey, Mike, you, we think we need some more memory. Um, you know, our server's using what we have. There's some signs that could probably use it. Can you, can you kind of do some analysis and get, dig into Perfmon and, and do some trending and, and, and tell us if we think if you, how much benefit we're going to get? And the answer to those clients, it's the point now where I say, listen, I, I'm not an overly expensive consultant, but it's actually less expensive for you just to buy the memory and put it in there than it is to spend a lot of time proving it in memory. And this is for clients who are, you know, they're using the memory. It's clear they're using it. There's there's signs that that their you know their databases are larger than the memory they have. So it's just it's the point where memory is is, is less expensive than SQL Server licensing. It's less expensive than consulting, um, and it's less expensive than than improving I/O and doing other things. So so you know memory is the one area I think people could probably spend more in than they do. Is that your experience too, Tim? Absolutely. Uh, you know, memory is pretty well cheap, uh, especially compared to server cores. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So you know, let, let's let's kind of speaking about about resources. You know, I, is there anything else you want to add about memory before I kind of switch switch gears a bit, Tim? No, I was going to say this this leads us you know really good into um, a couple other areas that, that need to be tweaked, um, such as uh, you know, max stop. You know, max degree of parallelism and the cost threshold for parallelism. Um, I don't know about you, but my experience is typically this has not been touched, changed. Um, clients have no idea what it is, what it's for, um, and out of the box is really not um, you know, optimal. Yeah. You know, exactly. Max sub zero is, is oh, I'd say, never good, right? <laughs> well. I would say no, but as I'm finding more and more clients you know, virtualizing, um, where they only have two to four vCPU, uh, I find it less of an issue than you know, back on physical iron with you know, 16, 32, 40 cores um, is where it you know, really can uh, you know, be a major major issue. But uh, also, I mean, the cost threshold for parallelism uh, being set to five by default. I mean, back in the, the late 1900s on that HP workstation in and what was it, building 35? Um, sure. Might have been okay, but you know, today <laughs> with the, the horsepower and the gear that we have, um, I'm just finding you know, that you know, that that's really inefficient. Yeah, I agree. I I think the key here is um, I get I get nervous when I, when I go to a client and I see one of two things: um, when I see one or when I see zero. <laughs> um, when I see zero, it's because I, I presume they probably haven't thought about changing it, especially like you said, especially if they're on you know more than a couple of v two, a couple of vCPUs. Um, 
throw on a either a physical box or throw on a server, you know, 12, you know, eight, six, eight, 12, whatever vCPUs. Um, the first thought that runs through my head is they they haven't um, they haven't they haven't seen they, they they haven't really seen some of the best practice guidance. They haven't really thought through the best practice guidance, and and they've they've made some mistakes. Um, when I see one. It tells me they've, they've, you know, unless they've thought through it, and one sometimes is okay. They, I'm not saying one is, is bad, but it used to be that one was the default. If somebody saw parallelism-related weights, they would change max degree of parallelism to one, eliminate parallelism, and all the problems would go away. Um, and they were right. Their, their parallelism weights would go away, but they haven't actually fixed the problem. They just disabled parallelism, basically. Um, so when I see those things, I, I get worried. Um, how about you, Tim? Is there anything else where you... You kind of get worried. Um, I mean, not so much. I mean, I, I freaked out a little bit more over you know seeing max stop set to one. Um, like you said, either they they came across a blog post or or maybe they were uh, working with SharePoint. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I found that you know increasing cost threshold for parallelism. I mean, just out of the box, I set it to thirty at, at, as a start, and you know typically adjust up from there. Um, and I've seen some some really really good improvements on uh, OLTP systems just by increasing the, the cost threshold up. I mean, it's it's made a made a, you know, a, a very positive difference. Yeah, I I agree. I agree. Um, you know, speak speaking of um, kind of best settings and and kind of folklore on on the web. Let's talk about TempTB real quick. You know, I, I find more people following the best practice funny. I'll find more people following best practice here than anywhere. Um, I find a lot of environments in multiple TempDB files, but they, they kind of just create a bunch. And you know, they, they, the old school used to be you always create one per core. Um, you know, they used to be create one per core, um, one per physical CPU, all sorts of advice. Right, Tim, you've seen that too, I would imagine. Absolutely. So there's actually a good white paper out there, a good uh, Microsoft, or a good uh, kind of knowledge-based article that's um, let me just put the uh, arrow up here, right here, um, and, and this kind of goes into the best practices, and this is actually really good. You know, gr greater than eight cores, um, start with eight, increase by four based on your contention. So, you, so you're not just increasing them to increase them; you're only looking for temp TB contention. Temp TB contention is you know you're, you're you're seeing latch latch weights basically or page latch weights on um, on the temp TB file structures. Um, and yeah. adding them there makes sense. There, there's what were we gonna say, Tim? I'll say yes. The latch contention on the GAM, SGAM, and PFS pages. Yep. And and if you're seeing that, you know, there's a couple trace flags that can help you. This is, you know, they talk about in the article here too. Um, and, and multiple multiple files help you. TempDB is the one database you know that can really take advantage of that because of how it's used and because of the because of the the mixed extents. And then you know, the, the knowledge base article talks a lot about it. But 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 having more than one TempDB file is generally Good practice. I tend to, when I set up a new SQL Server, I tend to start with eight. Is that if if it's more than eight cores? Is that what you do, Tim? Yeah. If it's more than eight, I start with eight, and then I, I sit there and I watch um, watch for contention. And and so far, I mean, eight ha has solved it. I have not had to go over over eight. Now I've come across clients that um, have twelve and, and and sixteen, but they're on thirty-two core, forty core machines. Um, I just point out that they could dial down, but you know they they had have gotten there for for some reason. Um, so in, in some cases, too many are are, are you know bad. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean starting with eight on a on a you know, sixteen core, thirty two core is is where I start. I agree. And, and there's a few more things we could talk about here. Um, we have a couple more slides to go. I want to just stop real quick. You know, there's an important point here, Tim, when you when you made the slides up that. Um, you know, I talked about this in the white paper too, but TempDB. Um, I, 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 we don't have a slide for this here. We talk about it in the white paper, but it, it deserves a couple seconds to chat. Anyway. Do, doing I/O wrong um, is 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 a very common mistake. Um, not not properly setting up your your I/O best practices. So not not having a fast enough storage for your TempDB. Um, Kind of putting TempDB logs and data files on the same the same spindle, same same drive letter. Um, that's a recovery thing and a performance thing, and and not really paying attention to what needs to happen. So, you know, 
Hemp B, in some environments, is the biggest database, in many environments, um, because it, it's, it's like one shared database for all, for all databases on that, on that instance of SQL. So it's really important to, to pay attention to FastIO. Um, MDB. You know, I, just, I just wanted to hang on that. Tim, do you want anything there, or you, you want you want to kind of talk about alerting? I, I think we should should you know, dive into the alerting because um, this is an area that is remarkably simple, um, but find way way too many clients aren't utilizing it. It's free. Um, it, it's you know, very easy to to configure. Uh, in our white paper, there's a, a link to a blog post by Mike uh, that includes video on taking you through and showing you exactly how to set up you know, SQL Server alerting. Yep. It just requires database mail. You configure the a mail operator to send the alerts you know, um, to yourself. I always recommend using a distribution group um, that would work the issues. You don't want it to just alert you, or maybe you do. Maybe you want to set it up for the first month so it goes to you so you can clean everything up uh, so you don't uh, uh, alert anyone else to um, uh, to issues that, that you should have been taking care of over the past couple of years. So you know, that's up to you. Uh, but longer term, it should be a distribution group. Um, so when yep. new people come into your team, uh, it's just a simple thing. It goes to your um, your DBA support group. Uh, we recommend that's like think of vacation. That, that's right, exactly. Um, DBAs don't take enough vacation in my mind. <laughs> You're exactly right. Um, but you know, we, we recommend severity alerts, um, you know, 16 through 25, or, or error 16 through 25, and 823 through 825. Uh, these agents can be created through a GUI or a script. Again, Mike provides all that uh, in reference material um, yep. from the, the white paper that we wrote. Yeah, there's, there's, there's basically videos. Uh, you can hear me talk some more if, if you really want to. But in about six minutes, you, you from six, in about six minutes, you can have alerts set up. So, so if, if you if you if you have great backups and you're doing your check DBs and your other maintenance is good, this is one quick thing you should take and just leave right away and just do. Um, it just works and you can have alerts going right away. Now, so, Mike, yeah. one, ca one caveat is when you when you configure these, it goes through all your error logs, correct? What, what do you mean now? So the, the first time you go and set up, so if I set up Severity Alert 16, it's going to go and scan my existing logs um, to send that out. Or does no. it start from the time that you create it? Yes, yeah, it's from the time you create it. Yeah, it, it, you're, you're not going to you're not going to fix problems that that happened yesterday. Um, that is a good point. Yeah, that, is that what you're getting at, Tim? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I thought I remembered um, in a uh, when you know, alerting became a, a feature that from the time that you had created, it would go go through and scan the the current active error log. So if, if your log was very old and, and you had some, some things that would have caused it to alert, it would then alert on those things in the log. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to double check that. You know, I, I think um, what we'll do is with, with the link to the white paper um, and some of the resources, we'll, we'll make an update and, and come in the chat room and make an update when I figure it out. But I'm fairly certain it just is from that point moving forward when, when an alert is trapped. I, I don't think it searches the log, but I, I, I may be wrong. Okay, we can we can validate that. Yep, and, and and you should look at monitoring tools. You know, we're in a couple of minutes. We're probably going to talk about some monitoring tools, right? But but tools are great. Alerts is better than nothing. Um, but but using a, a third party monitoring tool is is going to really help help kind of solve some of these issues and help find things for you in a more proactive way too. Um, you know, one more thing is two more two more find really just one more finding that we find people hurting themselves with. Um, and we could we could have made this list go on and on. The white paper has a few more, but this is this one is talked about all the time. Um, this is one that you probably have heard people talk about, but I would say at least twenty to thirty percent of the environments we go into and do well DBA exams on, we find power saving settings um, set incorrectly. Tim, you want to talk about that real quick and what it what it means? Sure. Um, so in an effort to try to go green, um, you know, operating system vendors, hardware vendors. Uh, use a, a feature called balance power, um, where what it does is it, it tries to, to save resources. So if you're not using your CPUs, it will basically idle them down, dumb them down, um, uh, strip cores from it, and you reduce the power. And you know that, that's great you know, for the environment, but it's not really great for your SQL Server. Uh, SQL Server is not really built to um, or is conducive to the, the balance power 
uh, model. Uh, you know, when you have something that needs a, a CPU spike, it needs it right then. It, it doesn't need it five seconds later. Um, so what you end up having to do is set your server to high performance. So this is a, a setting within the power options, um, and, and that's great when it works, but many times we found that the, the, the hardware has to have uh, power savings disabled in the BIOS. So uh, a nice tool to be able to you know, grab that's free, uh, my favorite four-letter F word, uh, free, is CPU-Z. Mm -hmm. You can you know, download it, install it on the server, does not require a reboot. Uh, I've yet to see it ever cause a, a problem you know, installing it on a, on a production server. And then you can look at your CPU settings and see the, the clock speed that's in use uh, and things like that. And it's really fun on your laptop to, to kind of fire up you know, some kind of workload and go through and turn balance power um, or the, the power setting from balance to, um, to high performance and, and watch the impact that it has uh, on your CPU speeds. Yeah. Um, right. Also with the, with the balance power, sometimes I mean, it, it can shut the, the network interface card off if there's no activity. Um, that could be very bad. Yeah, you, you don't want your Nick's going to sleep, I agree. So, you know, in, in this talk, we, we covered a lot of the things that, that we find in the field. Um, we didn't cover all the things at all. We, we, we could sit here for four hours and not cover all the things we find in the field. There's some fun stories, you know, some, some, come, come talk to us at an event sometime. We'll talk about some of the fun stuff, too. Um, these are all things, these, these are things that you can take proactive steps right now in your environment and, and make, it, make an impact on. You guys can can make a change in your environment and, and you know, you, you'll have a, a easier life, a happier environment, and I suggest you do that. Um, I want to talk about two quick resources. Um, one is, our, is a white paper we have, and, and a lot of the links we keep referring to are listed in this white paper. It's on Embarcadero's website. We thank them for, for hosting, hosting this talk and for hosting the white paper that the talk is kind of built on. Um, free white paper, you download it, and, and, and it gives you so many tips that, that really you can take and check your environment see how you're doing and make your environment better. You know, these are things that we find, people pay us to find, and we find you can do it yourself and be far better than, than, than most environments. Also, Tim has a great book. It's, um, it's on Amazon. It's a SQL Server 2014 backup recovery book. This is based on, on the first backup recovery book you wrote, updated for 2014 with some heat stuff in there. Um, you know, I won't spoil all the the, the plot lines are, there's no plot lines, I'll tell you, I guess, but I won't, I won't spoil all the, all the neat features and tips he talks about. It's a really cool book. Um, John Starrett coordinated on, on this one as well and collaborated, and, and it's uh, really good resources. It can really help you understand backup recovery, recovery models, and what to do. But this has been enough of us talking. You know, I, I guess I, I want to introduce Scott Waltz from, from Embarcadero, and, and thank you again, Scott, for, for having us here. And it's been, it's been great being able to sort of share some of our tips. And... Uh, Love to see what you have to share. Well, thank you, and th thanks, to Tim and Mike. Just a, a ton of information, and I'm, I'm jotting down some things here. Uh, and next thing I know, the hour's practically gone by. But before we before we totally run out of time, I want to take a few minutes to show a couple of products really quick that we have from Embarcadero, and and those products do complement those things that that Tim and Mike talked about. The, the one thing I want to talk is about change management. Right. And as we talked about some of the, the configuration and the setup, one of the things that we find with our customers is, is change management and understanding the changes that go on, not only at the database level, but also, you know, meaning the individual schemas, if you will, but also the configuration level, understanding if any configurations have changed as your living systems continue to go. So here's a, just a really quick example of what we can do. So we have the, the concept of an archive. So I've created an archive based on this data source. And I'm, create, I'm, I'm comparing it to a live data source. So we can go in to the refinements, drill in here. Here I just have isolated it just to one database. And we can certainly pick and choose which objects we'd like. In this case, I have these tables. And I can select the mapping if the databases are different in each of my environments. Certainly I have the ability to configure that. And, and some other settings. But the big thing I want to point out is our comparison results. So in this case, I ran it. I had a 97% match, right? So I can show the individual results right here. Drill in and understand exactly what happened. I have a lot of matches. I'm going to remove those because I really want to see what's changed. So here, I have an office location, has an email address, creates the alter script for me, right? It wants to remove that column from the live data space to make it equal 
to the archive. Here is a non-clustered index that I dropped. The script here is to recreate it. So again, really quick, easy way of finding out anything that's changed in your database. We can set this up to compare one to one, but we can also add multiple targets. So again, as we're setting up databases, and we can do the compares nightly, run those compares, have a report waiting for you in your inbox letting you know that those environments are indeed in sync. And the other product, real quick, is around optimization and tuning. And they talked, Tim and Mike talked a little bit about that, talking about some of the, um, the statistics and having the auto-update statistics on. And as I ran through my tuning wizard, and I'll show you this in a little bit, uh, I, I was, um, I guess, not too surprised to find a setting that was enabled. <laughs> so here is a, a profiling session. We've captured all this information. And just real, real quick down here are all the statements that are being executed. So at any time, I can come in and look at the details of the statements that are being executed here, the different iterations. Looking at the metrics and how much time, here's the database activity. This one took 41%. The other nice thing, if I want to take a sliver, a slice of time, right, I can highlight that time segment and bring that up. Right. What, what do we do when we find a problem query? We can take it over, we can tune it. We can also start with a brand new query. So here's a query that I have, dropped it in here, ran the results back. I took it from here. From the right-click context menu, pass it over to the Tune SQL. I'll hop over here and take a look at what we've seen here. So ran through the tuning job, created these cases. I have 203 different cases that DB Optimizer created for me. And I can look at these and see exactly what's changed. So here's one that's reduced the cost, also reduced the execution, the execution time. I want to see the difference. Click, select them both, compare selected. Look at that. Again, we're able to find exactly what was done. In this case, we just added a little hint here, right? The option hash join. Drop out of that. I want to go over here and, and, and expose what I found. So here, I'm looking at this. This is our visual SQL tuning diagram to the right. Or we can see the many-to-many -many relationship there, as well as here. But down here, we can start looking at index analysis. So here, right, letting me know that a client is scanned via full table scan, but it has a filter in the WHERE clause, right? If you look at all, suggest implementing this index. We'd like to it, create it, right click, select the index type we'd like, create index, brings that DDL for us really quick and easy. The other thing, table statistics. So again, I'm telling on myself here, I have automatic update stats turned on. So real quick, I'm able to see exactly what's happening here. Right, and as um, um, Tim and Mike mentioned, possibly not the right thing to have enabled. So, needless to say, after this webinar, I know what I'm going to be doing, and we can look at other column stats and histograms as well as any plan guides that might be there. So, again, this is looking at, at DB Optimizer, the way to profile and tune against your SQL Server database. And the first tool I, I showed was DB Change Manager, being able to compare both configurations and databases at the schema level, as well as data compares. We have the ability to compare data as well. So at that point, we're going to wrap it up. I want to pass it over to Mike to um, show the last slide so I can talk about that for a little bit. But as we talked about the two tools that I showed today, DB Change Manager and DB Optimizer, part of the Embarcadero DB Power Studio suite of tools. If you're interested in taking them for a test drive, they're full featured. 14-day evaluations. You can visit it at www.embarcadero.com slash products. You can find it there. Again, we'd like to thank Tim and Mike for this um, webinar and all the information that they provided. Hopefully, you have um, taken away some good information from the webinar. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining today. Thank you.